Hi, this is Mrs. Kidman, and in this video, we are going to be discussing periodic functions. So this is a practice test that you can kind of see. We're going to run over the basics of periodic functions. So we're going to go over things about whether or not functions are periodic. We're going to talk about things like how to use a function to determine values. Now, notice that this example we'll do is in sine, but it could also be done with cosine. We'll talk about writing equations of trig functions given graphs. We'll talk about how to sketch a graph of a trig function given the equation um, with horizontal shifts, a midline, and amplitude, things like that. Um, we will also go over um, just a couple other things related to these periodic functions. So. Hang tight as we go through each of these. If you feel like you need to jump ahead to the next thing, feel free to do that. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is how to determine whether or not a function is periodic. So a periodic function is a function that has a pattern that repeats itself over and over. Okay, and when we're talking about this pattern that repeats over and over, it repeats infinitely many times. So we're under the assumption that it looks the same over and over and over and over again. Now, because there's this pattern that repeats over and over, we have something called the period. The period of the function is essentially how long that pattern lasts. Okay, so as we're looking at how long that pattern lasts, what we're talking about there is not like time and seconds, but we're talking about how many, what those x quantities are. So from the starting to the end, what's the change in our x coordinates that we're looking at there, okay? So as we take a look at these different examples here, we want to talk about whether or not they're periodic, and then if they are, decide actually what that period is. Now, the most common type of periodic functions are sine, cosine, and tangent functions, so those trig functions. However, there are other type, types of graphs and functions that can also be periodic, depending on how you shift things. So we've got a couple of graphs here. Some of are periodic, some are not, and we want to determine if they are, and if they are, how long that pattern lasts. So if we're looking at this first one here, is this one periodic? The answer is no, based on what we can see, right? We see this pattern of it goes down, up, and then it goes and it goes down, up again, but this next time it gets bigger. So it's hard to assume whether the pattern repeats itself, and this next time we're going to go down and it's going to look similar, or if the pattern's going to keep getting bigger like this, right? Because if the pattern keeps getting bigger like that, then it would not be periodic. But if it follows some sort of pattern, it would. So because we don't know, we're going to assume that it's not, unless told otherwise. Now let's take a look at this next one here. This next one I would say is periodic. Now the reason why we would say it's periodic is let's take a look at our function itself, right? We start here, we come down, we go up, we come over. And then all of a sudden, as soon as we get here, the pattern repeats itself. And we can see that it's going to do that again. So as we switch our colors here from yellow to pink, you can see that our pattern is going to do that same thing. It's going to repeat that same V-ish pattern. So because it is periodic, we want to know how long that period lasts. So how long does that pattern go? So if we're looking from here until here, we can kind of count and see. One, two, three, four, five, six boxes. Each box in this case, if this one is a two and this one is a four, represents three. So if this has six boxes, our period is six units. Now we don't know if these are six seconds, six minutes, whatever that is, but it is a representation of six there. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. This one is also periodic because we have that same pattern that repeats itself over and over. Just like we did before, we've got this pattern that looks kind of like this and then it repeats. Now, the cool thing about periodic functions is where you draw that periodic piece is totally dependent on you. So we drew it from top to top, right, as the pattern repeats, but I could also say that this function goes from here to here. You can kind of see that blue there, and it's still that same pattern being repeated over and over and over again. And the cool thing is the pattern is the same length regardless of where you start. So if we start here, and we end here, each block here looks like it's one again. So we've got one, two, three, four. So our period is four. Same thing happens if I start here and I end here, I still am going that four blocks. So our period doesn't change even if the way that we count it does. So that pattern is still repeating itself over and over. This last one here, although we can't technically assume whether or not it's periodic, I would take the answer of yes or no. I'm going to say this one is. The reason why is this one really closely resembles a sine or a cosine function. And sine and cosine functions, as we know, are periodic. And those are the most applicable periodic functions that we see. So how long does this pattern last? Well, when you're looking at counting the period on a sine or a cosine function, the easiest way to do it is to either start from the middle until the middle. You can count from a top to a top, 
but we don't really have a top or a bottom to a bottom. Any of those is totally fine. I typically will try to count middle, middle, top to top or to bottom to bottom. Whichever one crosses the Y axis though is typically the easiest because that starts our X at zero and it goes up. So as we're looking at this, we go from zero up to two pi over five. So our period here would just be two pi over five because that's how far it goes, okay? So that's how we can determine whether or not something's periodic and find the period. Now we're gonna take a really common example of periodic functions, which are sine and cosine functions and identify some characteristics that they have. Okay, we're gonna talk about an amplitude, a reflection, a period, a phase shift, midline, things like that, and how they relate to a graph. Now, one thing that you'll know is we are gonna be looking at these trig functions in this form. A, I'm gonna put sine cosine because it can be either. We have this B times X minus h plus k sort of thing, right? This a usually controls our string and stretch when it comes to a function. h is usually your left and right shifts. k is our up and down, things like that. So you can see kind of how these work there. Now that b is factored outside of our sine or cosine, so make sure that you take that into account when you're doing a problem there. Um, but a, b, h, and k all represent different things. Sometimes these will be referred to as a, b, c, and d. It just totally depends on who's teaching it. Now, the thing that's common for all of us is the amplitude is going to be our A. But it's not just A, it's the absolute value of A. The reason why is amplitude right here is the distance from the midline to the maximum or minimum. So what exactly is the midline? Well, the midline is the middle. Right. This is the middle, halfway between the maximum and minimum. Now, some people will use that midline to calculate it, where our midline is the same thing as our maximum plus our minimum divided by two. It's exactly the average. You can calculate the amplitude by doing the max plus the min or minus the min, oh, excuse me, divided by two as well. But that's not necessarily as helpful when it comes to looking at this equation. But it is helpful when finding our maximum and our minimum. So it's that distance from our midline to the max or the midline to the min. Now, because it's a distance, distances are always positive. Whether I'm walking backwards or forwards, I'm still walking a distance. So because of that, we want to make sure that we know how this matches here. So it's always going to be the absolute value, which is why we have this reflection piece. Reflection is basically asking, is A negative? Right? That's what we're looking for here. If A is negative, then we've reflected. If A is not negative, then we're not reflecting. As simple as it seems. Our period is the relationship with B. So as we look at our B here in our equation, B represents the number of times we see the pattern, which is also called the cycle. So the pattern or cycle between zero and two pi. Okay, that's what B represents. So if we wanna find the period, we're gonna look at that and we're gonna kind of reverse calculate it. So our period is the same thing as two pi over B. So whatever B is, we'll just divide two pi by that and we'll go from there. Our phase shift is how it shifts left and right. So this is gonna be related to our H, also sometimes referred to as being C. So when we're looking at that, if it's an x plus a number, we're shifting to the left, x minus a number shifts to the right, just like with any other function. We kind of talked about our midline, our maximum is our highest point and our minimum is our lowest point. To find the maximum, what we are gonna do is we're gonna use our midline and our amplitude because those have that distance, that relationship there. So our maximum is going to be our midline plus our amplitude, while our minimum is going to be our midline minus our amplitude, because that'll kind of get us that difference there. So let's take a look at this problem all together with all of our pieces. So our amplitude is the absolute value of A or that first number. So our first number here is negative eight. The absolute value of negative eight, which just means how far is negative eight from zero, is eight. So our amplitude is eight, which means wherever our midline is, our maximum is gonna be eight above that. And wherever our midline is, our minimum is gonna be eight below that. Okay, we wanna decide is A negative, yes or no? The answer is yes. The reason why we care about this is because it tells us a sine function typically starts in the middle and it goes up and then down and then back to the middle. That's what a sine function does. If it gets reflected, we're gonna see it get reflected like this. Cosine does the same thing. Cosine usually crosses your y-axis at the maximum unless it's been shifted and it comes down and then back up. If we have a reflection, it's gonna start at the minimum and it's gonna go the other way, right? So we wanna be aware of whether or not it gets reflected. Let's calculate our period here. So I'm gonna switch our color just for, so we can kind of see. Our period is two pi divided by B. So I'm gonna 
to do 2 pi divided by b, which is just 2 in this problem. And 2 pi divided by 2 is 1 pi. Now, we want to know our phase shift, so how it shifts left and right. This is like any other function. This c, or h, is going to be this piece here. It gets shifted to the left pi. Now, what that means is if I had a function like my cosine, instead of crossing at the maximum here, my function will cross at its maximum over here. So I'm going to see something that looks more like this. It just got shifted. Sine does the same thing. So instead of crossing the y-axis at the middle, if it got shifted to the left, it would get shifted over here like this. Just shift to the left. Our midline is going to be the exact middle of our graph. It's also going to be the same thing, which we didn't talk about, as being k or d, depending on what we're looking at here. So that's our very last number here. So our midline is going to be our end number, which in this case is just 1. So to find our maximum, we just take our midline plus our amplitude and our midline minus our amplitude for our minimum. So our midline plus our amplitude, 8 plus 1 is 9. So that's where our maximum is going to be. Our midline minus our amplitude, so 1 minus 8, is going to be negative 7. Notice how those have a distance of double the amplitude, which is 16 apart. So that's kind of how we identify those pieces. Now, the reasons why we care about doing that is we can identify these same characteristics from a graph of a periodic function. And when we identify those same things, we're able to write a sine or a cosine function depending on what we want to do. Now, sine and cosine functions can be equal to each other if you use a phase shift to shift them. So not necessarily saying that this function we're about to write on this next example here has to be a cosine function. There's actually infinitely many ways to write a trig function. Unfortunately, there are infinitely many ways to incorrectly write one. So we're going to talk about the easiest ways to do it. So let's take a look here at our cosine function in all of its glory. So what we want to do here is remember A, B, C, and D represent different things. A is our amplitude. So we want to figure out what that amplitude is. Now, we know amplitude is the distance from the middle to the top or the middle to the bottom. So let's see if we can just figure out what that is. A is amplitude. Our B is the number of cycles between 0 and 2 pi. What that means, though, is we can calculate it using our period, right? So it's b is the same thing as 2 pi divided by our period. Okay, c is our phase shift. So what this means is we're going to look at where we want our function to typically start and then see where it actually started and see what it takes, what happened from where it should start to where it's going now. Our last piece here is our d. And with our D element here, that is going to be our midline. Okay, so that's going to be the middle. Now, we've been blessed enough with this image to be able to find our, our midline right in the middle here, right? We can see it. One, two, three is where our midline is going to go. So when I go to write my equation here, I'm going to have a plus three on the end because that's where our midline is. Our amplitude is the next piece that we want to do. That's the distance from my midline to my top or the midline to the bottom. Now, we can count in this case that it's just two. So y equals two. Now, this time we were asked to write a cosine function. We're going to go through that, but then I'm going to show you an example of if we wanted to write this as a sine function, how that would look a little bit different. So we've got 2 cosine. Now we need to figure out what b is. So we want to figure out the period and then do 2 pi divided by the period. So how long does our pattern last? Remember, we can do that by looking at top to top, middle to middle, bottom to bottom. Now top to top is the easiest one here because it crosses at 0, and it looks like it's about at 6 pi. So our period, in this case, is going to be equal to 6 pi. So b is just going to be 2 pi divided by 6 pi, which ends up giving us those pi's cancel, 6 over 1 over blah, 2 over 6, which gives us a 1 third. So we have a cosine of 1 third times our x. Now we need to decide if we have a phase shift or not. So cosine functions always cross the y-axis at their maximum. That's what they're going to look like there. And they keep going both directions. So does our function cross at the maximum? The answer is yes. So this one has no phase shift. So we don't even have to worry about it. Okay. Now we've got all those pieces there. Now what I want to talk about really quickly is what if we wanted to write this as a sine function instead? Now we can write this one as a sine function as well. And it still will give us the graph of the same thing. And if you don't believe me, type both of these equations that we find into a Desmos or a graphing calculator and see how they overlap perfectly. So if we wanted to do this, a lot of the pieces are the same. The amplitude is still going to be 2 if we wanted a sine function. Now we're going to write sine. Our phase shift is, or not our phase shift, our b is still going to be the same 
it's still going to be a one third. Our midline is actually still going to be the same. So most of the pieces don't change. The difference between a sine and a cosine function is literally just a phase shift. Did I shift left or right? Now, a sine function typically crosses on our y-axis at the midline. So it's going to cross at the midline, and it's going to look something like this if it gets shifted, going both directions there. So we want to decide where it should cross. Now, if we're shifting to our midline here, we typically, with our sine function, starts at the midline, and then it goes up to the maximum, down to the minimum, and then back to the midline. And then it repeats that pattern over and over. Now, we can shift this lots of different ways. We could take the point over here, which we can see our graph coming to, and use that to shift. But we can't see what that x value is here. So that's not a great point. But we want a point like that. So where does the pattern repeat again, looking at the same place? Well, I'm going to look over here. And we can see that that line is about 9 pi over 2. So what we want to do is we want to shift it 9 pi over 2. That's where it should be. But compared to the y-axis here, which way did it get shifted? It got shifted to the right to get to that point. So because it got shifted to the right, we need to write something that represents a shift to the right of where we actually want it to be. So imagine shifting your y-axis to that point. My y-axis would have to get shifted to the right in order for me to get there. So we're going to shift to the right. So that means an x minus whatever that shift is, so a 9 pi over 2. And that's how we would write it as a sine function. So both of these equations here are actually the same function. You just graph them a little bit differently. Now, on this practice test, if you're one of my students going through it, there is an example of a sine one. This one doesn't have a shift. You can see that the reason why it doesn't have a phase shift is the midline is here at 2, and it crosses right there. If I wanted a cosine function, this one would again get shifted to the right. It would just be shifted to the right pi is kind of what we're looking at there. So we are going to skip that. However, we're going to take a look at doing the opposite. So what if someone gives me an equation, but I want to know what the graph looks like rather than going the other way? So what we're going to do here is we are going to take a look at our function and kind of see how that comes into play. Now, just like we did before in that other example of identifying all of our characteristics here, we want to do the same thing from this equation. So our amplitude matches our A. So that's going to be our three here. There's no reflection on it. Our midline is our D, or sometimes known as our plus K, right? However you want to look at it. So in this case, our midline is going to be at minus one. Our phase shift is going to be inside those parentheses. There's nothing there, so we don't have one, which makes it super nice to graph. We'll practice graphing this next one as well so that you can kind of see how that works. Our period is going to be the same thing as 2 pi divided by our B. So we want to calculate this. So in this case, we're going to do 2 pi divided by b, which is 2. So our period is just high on this problem. And that'll come into play when it comes to actually graphing. We want to find our maximum and minimum because it really helps. So our maximum and minimum, remember the max is our midline plus our amplitude. And our mid minimum is our midline minus our amplitude. So we want to be able to find it from there. So to find our maximum, we would just take our midline, which was negative 1, plus 3, which gets us to 2. For our minimum, we would take our negative 1, and we would minus 3, which would take us to negative 4. Now that we have all those pieces, we can draw our graph. So when we go to draw our graph, our first step is we need to draw our horizontal lines. Okay, these horizontal lines are going to give us boundaries so that we can kind of see where we're drawing between. The horizontal lines that you're going to draw is you're going to draw one at your midline. Then you're going to draw one at your maximum and one at your minimum. So let's go ahead and draw that on here. I'm going to draw my midline. Then I'm going to draw a horizontal line at my maximum, which was 2, and down here at my minimum, which is negative 4. Beautiful. Got those lines all drawn. Okay, the second thing that we have to do, this is the part that gets a little weird, is we need to draw our vertical lines. Now, our vertical lines are going to be base vertical lines, not verticals, our vertical lines. So our vertical lines are going to be based on our period and the phase shift. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start, our first vertical line is going to be at zero with our phase shift, okay? So what that means is if I had a phase shift to the left, I would start my line here at zero, and then I would shift it to the left however many my phase shift is. If I have one that goes to the right, I would shift it to the right that far. And that's what we're gonna do. This case, we don't have any, so we're just gonna draw a vertical line here at zero itself. Our second line is going to be at our period, however long that is, with our phase shift. Okay, so what this means is, in this case, our period is pi. So I'm going to come over to my graph where pi is, 
which happens to be right here, and do my phase shift. So if it was a right, I'd shift it to the right. If it was a left, I'd shift it to the left, whatever that phase shift is. In this case, we don't have one, so I'm just going to draw another vertical line here at pi. Now, all of these trig functions kind of have four motions, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, right, depending on what we're doing. So that's kind of what we want to look at. Sine is always going to go from your midline to your max, to your midline, to your minimum, unless there's a reflection, which you'll see in the next example. Your cosine function, on the other hand, is going to go from your max to your mid, to your min, to your mid, and then back up to your max. It'll just repeat itself. So because we have all those motions, we want to draw each, split each shape into four equal pieces. So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to approximate it by drawing down the middle. This one worked out nicely where they were all evenly split. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. So we just have to be aware of splitting it. Now, where it's a sine function that we're graphing, I'm going to start in, oh, I'm going to start in the middle. So I'm going to do this one in a little bit of a different color. Let's use this like bright pink. Can everyone see that on there? Sweet. Okay, so you're going to start by putting it at your midline and your vertical line there. Start at my mid. Then I'm going to go to where my vertical line matches my maximum. Sweet. Vertical line matches my middle, matches my bottom, matches my middle. Now that pattern is going to repeat itself over and over, so you're going to want to keep sketching it. Notice how I became less and less accurate the further over that I got. This first piece is going to show us that exact accuracy there. Now, another way that some people graph is they say, I know that B is 2, so between 0 and 2 pi, I need to draw my pattern twice. Whichever way makes you feel better is totally going to work. However, I like this method of being able to say, this is my period and this is how it shifts. It really helps. So now that we all know all of that, let's take a look at this next question here and go through all of those steps together, because this next one has a couple more pieces to it that we want to add in. So our amplitude in this case is positive 2. Note the reflection. It gets reflected. We want to make sure we know what to do with that. So I'm going to write it down here. Reflected. It was reflected. Okay, our midline is what we add at the end. So a negative one. Our phase shift. This one gets shifted to the right pi. Now it's really important to note that it goes to the right pi. Now a reminder, our period is 2 pi divided by b. Um, if you aren't good at dividing fractions, remember your copy dot flip or your multiply by the reciprocal. If that one doesn't help, um, you can always type it into a calculator. So we're gonna do two pi divided by one half. So if we do that over here, two pi divided by one half is the same thing as two pi multiplied by its reciprocal, which is going to give me four pi over one, which is just four pi for that period there. Our maximum is our midline plus our amplitude, so negative one plus two, which is just one. Our minimum is our midline minus our amplitude, which will take us to negative three. Okay, so now let's go ahead and graph this. We have our horizontal lines. That's what we need to graph first. So that's gonna be at our, our midline, our max, and our minimum. So we are gonna put those ones on here. I'm gonna put those ones on here in yellow, just so that you can kind of see. Our midline is here at negative one. My maximum is here at one, and my minimum is here at negative three. Next, we're going to go ahead and draw in our vertical lines. I'm going to do those ones in this bright green color. Our vertical lines are going to be at our zero with our phase shift and our period with our phase shift. So in this case, zero with a phase shift, we went to the right pi. So instead of drawing my line here, I'm going to go to the right pi, which in this graph here, pi is going to be this one right here. You can kind of see how that's a pi. So we're going to draw our line right there, right pi, which is going to be right here. That's going to be my starting point. Then my period is 4 pi. So I come over here to 4 pi, but then I'm going to shift it to the right pi. So instead of going here, I'm going to shift it to the right pi. So my next line is going to be here at 5 pi. Now we talked about how we want to split them into four equal pieces, so we can kind of decide what that graph looks like. This one also conveniently splits for us. You get that 3 pi, that 2 pi, that 4 pi. Okay, so now we've got it. Now we are going to start drawing our lines here. I'll start drawing our dots there because we have that shift and we are going to finish drawing our lines here, our dots there, and then continue our pattern on. So let's go ahead and go back to that bright fuchsia color that we used on the last problem so that we can kind of see what we're doing here. So I'm going to start. This is a cosine function. So cosine, as we talked about before, typically goes maximum to our midline to our minimum to our midline and then back up to the maximum and it repeats itself over and over and over again. But we got reflect 
flipped it. So we need to flip all of these. So the opposite of max is minimum. The opposite of midline is still midline. The opposite of minimum is our maximum. And the opposite of my middle is still my middle. So we're going to completely reflect it. So what happens is instead of starting here at the top, this one we're going to start at the bottom. And then we're going to go up to our middle, the top, the middle, the bottom. Now I know this looks like a V and you can make this sharp line like this. But that's not what these functions look like. So you're going to kind of curve it as you go. And then you want to continue on with your pattern there over and over. And you can do it on both sides. Remember, periodic functions repeat themselves over and over and over again. So that there is how we can sketch a graph of those functions. Now, the very last piece that we have here is there's some application of different things. And we're just going to take a look at one of them. So applications of these run in lots of different places. A common one is used to model things that are circular, right? So you might learn about an angular velocity or something like that. You're thinking about things in these contexts here. So let's take a look at this. You and your buddy are riding a Ferris wheel at the fair. Your height above ground with respect to time at the of the Ferris wheel can be modeled by this function. So we want to identify some of the key characteristics. So first, we want to identify our amplitude here. So our amplitude is going to be our 17 because it matches with our A. Does this get reflected? The answer is no. The reason why is A is not negative. Our period is always going to be... 2 pi divided by b. Well, in this case, our b is this 2 pi over 25. So we're going to do 2 pi over 25 divided by, or 2 pi divided by 2 pi over 25, which we can just multiply to be 2 pi times 25 over 2 pi. Our 2 pi's will cancel each other out because they're on top and bottom. And we're left with a period of 25. So what that means is the entire rotation around the Ferris wheel takes 25 minutes because that's how long the pattern lasts. Our midline is going to be right here at 21. Our phase shift is any shifts left and right, and there are none. So that would be like if you didn't start on the ground or at the top, like maybe you started in the middle, but they used a cosine function to model it or something like that. Okay, what is the maximum height above the ground? Well, remember, the maximum is the same thing as the midline plus the amplitude. So we would do our 21 plus our 17, and the answer would be 38 feet above the ground, which is pretty high. What is our minimum height? That is going to be our midline minus our amplitude, which 21 minus 17 is 4 feet. As a quick reminder here, we are not going underground with this Ferris wheel. If you've seen one, awesome, but that's not the case that it has. That happens. How long does one rotation last? Well, a period is how long the pattern lasts, and the pattern would be one rotation. So the answer is 25 minutes. Okay, what is the radius of the skyscraper? This is a weird question. So the skyscraper, they're talking about this Ferris wheel here. Ferris wheel, Ferris wheel, Ferris wheel. So let's think of a Ferris wheel. We want to find the radius. So the radius of a circle goes from one edge into the middle, right? So this is like the minimum. Our maximum would be if it went all the way across. But we want half that distance. But what's this line right in the middle? Well, this would be like our midline. So what do we call the distance from the midline to the minimum? or the midline to the maximum, the amplitude. So the radius is the same thing as our amplitude. Perfect. Hey, this last question says, if you've been riding the skyscraper for 35 minutes, how high above the ground are you? So remember our equation is in terms of time. So all you have to do is plug in 55 for T and it'll tell you. So we're gonna do 17 times the sine of two pi over 25 times 55 plus 21. Now make sure your calculator is in radian mode here because that pi means radians. If it's in degree mode, you will get a weird answer. Okay, so as we go to calculate it, we want to type that all in there. So I've got 17 times the sine of 2 pi over 55. Now typically we don't type pi into our calculator over 25, sorry, over 25 times 55 plus 21. Um, we type that in there and you should end up getting 37. Uh, you should end up getting about 37 feet for this one. Okay, it might be like 37.1 feet or something, which makes sense. We're almost at the top there. Now, as a quick reminder, when you're doing a question like this, um, you can type it straight into your calculator. Make sure it makes sense. If you got an answer of 42, that wouldn't make any sense because the highest point that we can reach on our Ferris wheel is 38. So just make sure that as you're doing these, you are careful of how those units match the context of the problem. So that is our periodic functions unit in a nutshell. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out, but that's periodic functions.